Right, just make sure I'm recording. All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SB20 Australia um, in conversation number eight. Uh, tonight is a uh, loosely described session of um, tips and tricks of SB20 sailing, and we're lucky to have on board, um, no sailing joke that, but on board tonight, we've got uh, Ollie Burnell and Tim Burnell. Um, just to set any records straight, they aren't father and son. Um, uh, Tim is Ollie's uncle. Um, just welcoming Richard from the UK, he's just joining us as well. Um, we've, we've covered a lot of things over the last um, seven or eight se or seven sessions, but we thought tonight it might be a nice opportunity just to start sharing some of the, just the little tips and tricks that, um, that we all uh, use to keep the boat fast and sailing efficiently and keeping it nice and flat. Um, everyone will do things differently, I know. Um, so feel free to actually share what you want to share. As I say, if you want to keep trade secret secret, up to you, but it'd be nice um, if we can share a few things that might, I guess, basically all make us, um, well, not me, because I don't sail, but um, better SB20 sailors. Um, Richard, thanks for joining us from the UK. Nice to see you back in Hobart, even if it's virtually. <laughs> um, and have we got Ireland online tonight as well? Yes, we do. Thank you for joining us as well. Um, Ollie and Tim, um, Ollie, can you give us a bit of a background onto your sort of sailing uh, history so far? Um, yeah, so I started sailing from a bit of a young age, probably got pushed in it, into it by my old man and Tim um, and my grandparents a bit more than um, I sort of wanted to when I was quite young. Um, however, I haven't, haven't really looked back. I've loved my sailing. Um, started in International Cadets um, down at Sandy Bay Sailing Club and um, yeah, never really um, enjoyed doing that. Um, got to travel the world, which I was pretty lucky to do with a few um, international regattas. Um, so, yeah, it's been really good to progress to um, the SB20s and um, through my sailing um, career in a few different classes. So um, we, I've sailed SBs now for um, probably six to seven years, had a year um, sailing a youth boat, crewing on a youth boat and then steering um, my own youth boat thanks to um, the Derwent Sailing Squadron. Um, and um, yeah, we bought um, my old man, my brother and I sail um, the SP20 Honey Badger together here in Hobart. Um, we did the World Championships and um, yeah, we've been really enjoying not only sailing together, um, but racing against friends and um, competitors on the water um, so it's been really good racing. Thanks Ollie and um, just a, a quick uh, discussion about the Asia Pacific Champions League, I can't let that go. Yeah um, so um, Australia's tried to have their own little part of the, um, uh, the sailing league that um, is big in Europe, obviously Chapo another um, SB20 sailor went over um, as the only Australian and won it last year, first time that someone out of Europe has won it. Um, so we decided to go and um, as a Hobart team and um, take them on. So I had a crew of Sam Tiedemann, another Australian SB20 national champion, uh, Chloe Fisher, who um, is a 49er FX sailor who was at the time doing an Olympic campaign, um, and Jack Allison, who sails on one of the... Um, youth boats that we have down here. Um, so predominantly SB20 sailors and um, we're lucky enough to go over and compete against the best clubs in Southern Australia and um, went pretty well over there and managed to string some wins together and um, knock off another Tassie team to win the championship. It was a great, great effort from you and, and your team, Ollie. Um, Tim, can you give us a, a bit of a, a summary of, um, of your career today, a little bit longer than Ollie's? Yeah, it's funny. Listening to Ollie's career, it sounds similar to mine, except I actually was in reverse. I did mine about 20 years before Ollie. Um, <laughs> I was the youngest of three siblings, and I was dragged along to sailing clubs because my older brother and sister sailed. And I hated sailing when I was a nipper. I don't probably like it much more now than I did then, but <laughs> they used to... Um, I used to have to be bribed with icy poles to go sailing. And I used to, as an eight-year-old, I used to be able to convince race committees to turn 
to um, cancel yacht races if it blow more than 12 knots or so. But, um, but all jokes aside, so I, I grew up through dinghies and so on in Hobart. And then um, I spent a lot of time overseas. And I was very, very fortunate uh, to be given quite a lot of opportunities overseas. And I've always said, half jokingly, but half um, not in jest, that sailing is a sport that, it's, that if you know people, it's more important. That's that's the bigger um, opportunity you get. You, you might be a fantastic sailor and the best sailor around, and, and this is true probably for people in Hobart, people like Nick Rogers and Co. But if you know someone, certainly overseas, if you know someone, you will get on a, onto a campaign, and um, and then you go from there. So I was very. I, I moved to England because I, in, in my early twenties, I found myself travelling to England more and more, or Europe more and more, at my own cost to to do sailing events. Um, and then I moved over there, uh, fell in with the right crowd. Funnily enough, from, from people I met when I was 10 years old sailing cadets, um, including Ben Vines, who we, who we did the SB20 campaign together, you know, 30 years later, 35 years later. Um, and then, so over the, say, last 10 or 15 years, I've sailed everything from SB20s right up to 180-foot um, classic um, super yachts and 100-foot maxis and transatlantic races and, and um, record attempts and so on. I did a lot of far 40 sailing with an Italian campaign. Um, and really it's all, it, that all came from just knowing the right people, um, attaching, like a limpet, attaching yourself to some very, very good sailors and then had speaking just enough BS to make people think that you know what you're talking about. And then you um, you get on board and, and you stay on board. So yeah, very, very fortunate in my, in my sailing. And now I've moved back to Hobart and, Sailing's a distant memory. Not for much longer, hopefully, Tim. And I hope they're not still bribing you with um, icy poles to get on board some of those yeah. big boats. Richard Power used to bribe me with things much stronger than icy poles. <laughs> Trust me, he still needs to be bribed. We've tried to get him out on the SB20 when someone hasn't been available from our boat. And even to sail with family, we still need to um, give him a few beers at the end of the day just yeah. to get him out there. I'm now strong <laughs> enough and old enough to say no. <laughs> It's probably because it was over 12 knots, Ollie. Exactly, and under 17 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about rigging boats. Um, Ollie, I know one of your secrets to success is, um, as you've told me, uh, is not letting your dad rig the boat. Um, please explain. Um, yeah, so um, from a very early stage in our sort of SV20s, we worked out that dad probably hadn't been touching ropes for a good 20 years um he he'd sort of he still kept his foot in with um the sailing scene but sort of would jump on boats and just um steer boats for people um so he steers the sb20 and one of our rules on the boat and to toby my brother who's on tonight will back me up that um rigging the boat is predominantly toby and i whenever um, we're unavailable or coming late, um, Dad, unfor like Dad unfortunately would do something wrong and then would spend most of the pre-start fixing that sort of stuff. So um, I know we talked about it in another one of these preparation and um, getting doing the prior preparation. Um, but for us, one rule that we have is just not to let him touch the boat. Um, and that way, we know where everything is. If we break something, we know where it is downstairs and whatever, but um, a little dig at dad there, just we let him steer. And um, there's a few other boats who's the same, I believe. And for our um, international guests, um, Paul Burnell is a, is a world champion sailor in his own right and, um, and one of the uh, sailing icons in Tasmania. So, uh, which is why we're probably ribbing him, aren't we, Ollie? Yeah, absolutely. And um, everyone down here um, is aware that, of that and he doesn't mind that from a few people. Um, what's Richie just said? Um, Paul, oh, Paul better than Tim. Oh, we'll get on to that later, I think, Richie. <laughs> um, and so where do you prefer to sail, though? Um, Ollie, you prefer to be on the helm or trimming the main sheet or what's your preferred position? Yeah, it's actually been a funny transition back into steering in SB20s. Um, I, I steer most other boats I've sailed. Um, I, um, 
uh, through dinghies and stuff. And then I did a year steering a youth SB20. And um, it's been funny to jump back into um, going on the front. But um, for us, it was sort of a natural thing that dad steers the boat. Toby would go in the middle and I'd go on the front. Um, but yeah, I do, I do enjoy steering. I've been lucky enough the last couple of years, dad's, um, dad had a pretty uh, bad injury and, um, and was unable to sail for a year or two. And um, I jumped on um, the helm and um, got a bit more practice up in the SBs. And I think that's why um, I progressed so well to the sailing league. Um, but yeah, I, I quite enjoy um, being on the front, usually being on the front, um, we seem to compete against the top guys a bit more with dad steering and, um, and Toby and I doing the grunt work in the boat. Um, but no, I do enjoy steering and um, getting out there. We did most Thursday nights last season um, and tried to keep it, tried to rotate a few youth um, from Sandy Bay Sailing Club through um, and compete with people that way. It's always a feature of your, your cruise. Well, two things that always strike me, you're very relaxed. There's never any shoes on your feet, but also you've always got these youngsters on board. So um, it's great taking those youngsters from the cadets into having a you know, try of the SB20. Um, Tim, how about you in terms of sailing on, on the SB20s? You're usually in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's quite funny. I, when I was younger, I always steered dinghies and I always um, believed that I was a good a good driver but when Richard when Richard Powell first mooted the idea of um, putting the Marvel campaign together I don't know why he chose Ben and I, I think he probably chose us because we were all good mates and got on but um, I think what Ollie touched on is a valid point I think the most important thing in any in any um, campaign or boat is you've got to play to each other's strengths and with Ben Vines Ben's probably uh, he'd be certainly be one of the best um, true amateur sailors in the world and has been for 30 years and he's an extremely good um, driver. Um, Richie's very big, so there was no... I was never going to um, take him off the... We were never going to get him off the spinnaker sheet and everything like that, and I'm kind of good at talking a lot of crap, so I ended up in the middle and and spoke and shouted at everyone and said where to go. But I think that's the important thing. I, I don't know what Richie was thinking when he picked Ben and I to get involved with Mark with Marvel, but um, there was never any doubt that Ben would be Ben would be driving the boat. Um, and Richard's actually online tonight. Richard, I'm not sure if you're set up there with your microphone, um, but uh, perhaps you could actually answer that question of why you did choose um, uh, Tim and Ben. I, I still regret that decision, to be honest, Jane. It was a... Um, we'll have to have a therapy session later. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, uh, the, the, the thing that Tim is very good at is uh, strategy. And when you flip between small boats and big boats, uh, you have more roles on a small boat, but, the, but they are all the same. And I think Tim, Tim's strength is uh, keeping his head out of the boat. It's a very easy thing to say, but it's an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, and a lot of the time it was, it, he was able just to say to, to Ben, shut up and drive. And he was watching other boats, positioning boats, particularly in one design, working out where the wind is, et cetera. And that um, I think is really underestimated when you go through uh, sort of normal club sailing into the next level. So Tim's role on the far forties towards the end was sitting in the boat doing exactly the same, not touching strings or tillers or wheels or anything else like that. But the idea of putting the crew together, um, it was as much Ben's idea, but it was a, an international one design class, which was uh, regattas in Lake Garda and Cascais and Ireland and all that sort of stuff. So it was the international uh, that would, would be quite fun. Uh, Tim and I sailed a fair bit in the early 2000s on big boats. Um, so yeah, not quite sure how it all came about, but actually... Uh, it's funny that, Richard, if I can, if I can um, interject, there's two things. I think you must have misheard it because it was Ben saying, shut up, Tim, and let me drive. <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> Um, yeah. But the other, I remember when Richard spoke to Ben and I and said, I'm thinking about doing a small boat campaign. Do you want to get involved? And I remember Richard saying, the choices are a Dragon, a J70 and an SB20. 
And I'd done a little bit of SB20 sailing out of the Hamble with Jerry Hill um, in the Solent, which didn't really um, get me to love the SB20 sailing. I think the only people that like sailing in the Solent are the Poms. Um, but I remember us talking about it and it was never going to be Dragons because I could never live up to Nick Rogers' titles in the Dragons. So that was never going to happen. Um, and we spoke about what boat was best. And effectively, we turned around and said, well, it doesn't matter what boat we sail as long as they're all one design. And it's all about um, where we go, who we sail with, what are the people like? And we knew, I mean, this was what, five or six years ago, Rich, and we knew by then how strong the SB20 class was um, in numbers, how enjoyable the class was, how the class didn't take itself too seriously, how it sailed in the best places in the world. Um, so we said, let's go for the SB20. And I don't think that is a decision that we probably have ever regretted, Richard. I don't think we would have had anywhere near as much fun in any other type of boat we sail. Um, it, was a, it was a huge positive that the world's ended up in Hobart with the connection to me. Obviously, I was living in the UK at the time. And I think we decided that we were going to do three work. We, ben and I said, right, we'll do it, Richard, but we're not going to sail any more than five weekends a year, including the world's. Um, which was probably a mistake in the early years. And we said we were going to do three world championships, which was the uh, Lake Garda, which was fantastic, Cascais, which was just unbelievable, and ending up in Cowes because that's where we all lived at the time. Um, obviously then, five months later, well, we knew by that stage that Tassie was coming along and Richard and Ben have both done the Sydney to Hobart. I'm from Hobart, so um, we threw that one in right at the end. And... Without a doubt, I think that one of the reasons why we did better in Hobart than anywhere else was A, a the experience. We'd been sailing them much longer by then and four years of five weekends a year is all of a sudden 20 weekends. So whilst we didn't really do much sailing, we, we'd sail them a lot more by then. But I think also our, our, our three-year campaign was done and dusted. So Hobart really was just a super relaxed, weren't going in there with any expectations. We'd... It was the last hurrah. The, the boys turned up in Hobart. I think you landed, Richard, the day of the first um, race of the pre-Worlds, which was only a day before the world. I picked you up at the airport at nine o'clock and we were racing by 11 o'clock. Yeah, because it was so early in the year. Um, we basically had New Year's Eve at home, got on a flight on the 1st of January, arrived with you on the sec second or third, I can't remember what it was, Went sailing that afternoon, um, missed the first race of the pre-worlds and started the second race of the pre-worlds and, and that was it. It was a slightly crazy sort of timing um, for, for us. But uh, yeah, those, those campaigns where you, you're not racing week in, week out, you have to be quite organised about that. But the SBs are sufficiently simple that you can set them up reasonably, took a while to work it out, but reasonably quickly. And and we, we turned up at the at the dock and Tim had the boat ready to go, which was that was very nice. Lost it, then lost the masthead. <laughs> I'll just add something to that as well because um, Dad went over and did a cows week with you guys, and oh, God, um, I, about I feel that. I feel like your um, your crew were quite a unique crew, Richard, um, and your um, program was quite different to anything Dad had ever done. So. Um, you guys definitely had a lot of fun and um, enjoyed each other's company. And I think that's why you guys did find success um, and have so much fun. Actually, if we're talking about, Jane, that's a nice little segue into racing tips and so on, because there's two things there. Um, I'll start with the event that we did in Cows with Paul Burnell. Um, one thing about boat preparation, you're dead right, Ollie, on the last day of Cows Week, and Cows Week, if anyone's done Cows Week, it's not like normal SB20, Regattas, you just go off for a. It's a four and a half hour race, and it's zigzagging all over the solar and it's, it could be nice weather. It's more likely to be shitty weather in that place. And we started this race, um, and Richie had set the uh, what kind of, the Velocitech up on the on the mast. Richie, admittedly, had had quite a big night the night before, probably out until, and a big night for Richard Power is getting home as the sun's coming up type thing. And we'd all my sons. And, my and I, yeah, and I don't know why, but normally I'd normally I'd punch the velocity as we go and ping the line. But anyway, Richie did it this day, and we were approaching the start line with about I don't know eight seconds to go, and we were well and truly punched. 
we will, and I thought this is a bit funny. And this is off, this is off the greening cow, so they've got all the cannons, and everyone's watching us anyway. We start the race, and we looked, we looked over, but the Velocitech said we were, the Velocitech actually said we were 70 metres behind the line, so we definitely weren't 70 metres over behind the line, but we thought we might be okay. Anyway, we do a four and a half hour race, and lo and behold, we were called OCS. It turns out that Richie, in his drunken stupor, had put the Velocitech on upside down and had pinged at the wrong end of the line. So we were actually 70 metres over the line when we started. And the worst thing is we didn't even win the race, which was bad. But, but on the serious note, I think I one of the things... Reception's really bad on this call. I, I... I think one, on a serious note, though, one of the things we did learn over the years um, in that we would turn up to... The, we had um, illusions of grandeur when we first got into the class. We thought we'd be top five in the worlds and so on. And I think we were a bit disrespectful to the depth of the class and and at at every different world championships Hobart was a little bit different um, but every it, no that's not that's not true at every different world championships you get a flood of local very good savers that will choose to come into the class for a season and just take a hit and take it um, an opportunity to try and win a world championship so that's certainly true in Garda, Cascais, even the UK so we would turn up and and, and signing only five weeks five weekends a year before the World Championships. We'd still be playing around with, with rig settings. And we would... And then when we got to Hobart, Jerry Hill actually made a, made a comment about as long as the rig is straight in the boat, it, from side to side, tack to tack, it doesn't make that big a difference what you get. And I don't know whether, you got, whether there's been discussions about this over the last six months or so, but that was our... I think our biggest gain in Hobart was we would go out before the start and Ben's got a very good eye for the rig, much better eye than I do. We would we'd sail up wind, we'd we'd look up the rig. If it was straight, we'd tack over. If it was still straight, that was it. As long as the rig was straight in the boat, straight up and down, we would not touch the rig for the rest of the day. And in Hobart, in all the changing conditions in Hobart, um, I think that was a huge um, gain to us. And it just allowed us to forget about that for the for the rest of the day and just sail the boat. Whereas in previous years we'd we'd be talking about half a turn off and then oh half a turn on that one that's not quite straight the you know the the d2 is not right on starboard and stuff like that and you, and it's just another factor that distracts you from actually getting your head out of the boat and, and start and doing what you do starting well and starting well mm. um, and that's probably uh, it's probably one of the, the only regrets i have is that we didn't spend more time in the in the previous years, sailing and learning more about the rig, but at the end of the day, Jerry Hill basically said, "Look, the boats aren't that sophisticated. The rigs, the rigs aren't even that sophisticated. They're putting half a turn on a rig here and half a turn on a rig on there, the, the, half the rigs. And Nick Rogers probably knows this better than most. Every rig's probably a little bit different anyway. Um, and that served us so well in Hobart, just making sure the rig's straight and then forgetting about it and going sailing. Now, other people might say that's a load of crap and we change the rig by half a turn and we go half a knot faster. But that's you, what we that's what we mean. Do you think that um, was suited to Hobart as well more than other places, Tim? Um, I don't know. I mean, Hobart's relatively flat. Well, it was flat water, yeah. But, I mean, very changing conditions in Hobart. Probably cha more changing conditions in Hobart than Garda and Cascais, for sure. Um, I don't know. I think I think it's, it was it's as much rig as mental. You just don't, you just have, we didn't have to worry about it. We went out, there was, in that day the, the, of the pre-worlds, we went out and we thought we had the rig right and it was a, it was an absolute disaster. We were being, we were overtaken upwind by people going through our lee and everything else and then went back, got the rig straight, left it for the rest of the event. Um, one of the things I think with the worlds is that, I mean, of a, usually you expect that local knowledge would, you know, push you towards the top of the fleet. And I think from, I think Andrew might have said, Andrew um, Smith might have said this before, you know, local knowledge didn't really pay off for local sailors because the conditions weren't as they normally would be. You guys came third in that world. So so what was it um, that got you to that podium finished him? Yeah, I don't know. It certainly wasn't local knowledge because it was just an odd, very odd regatta. You know, even the sea breezes weren't true sea breezes when you thought, you know, five times out of ten or nine times out of ten, you'd go one way in a sea breeze and it didn't happen. Um, I think the rig was a big thing. I think the fact that it was just, we were we were in 
just totally relax. We were here to have fun. We weren't, we didn't give ourselves any expectations. The previous years, we started the campaign saying, right, we want top 10 in the first world. We want top five in the second world. And after the, once you get to top five, anything can happen. And I think we missed, missed both those targets just. I think we were 12th in the first world and seventh in the eighth in the second world and seventh in the third world. Um, and we just turned up. We didn't have, we didn't have any expectations. All the boys had been drinking for 48 hours before they even landed in Hobart. You know, um, I was going to work. Wayne was a bit tricky. Yeah. You know, I was going to work in the mornings and so on. We just, it was, we just took it. We treated it just like a fun weekend event. Um, yeah. And it was, you know, it was a hell of a lot of stress and everyone knows what it's like. But um, I don't know. We just, we started, we, the, we had a very good first race. It, it could have been better. We were a little bit unlucky down the last run. Um, but I think if you have a good first day, it, it obviously gives you a lot of confidence and we were relaxed about it. We were, it was going to be the last time the three of us were ever going to sail with each other. We weren't going to see, I was staying in Hobart, so we weren't going to see each other for a long time again and we just enjoyed it. So, um, obviously, I've taken a fair few photos of you guys sailing over the years um, and uh, when, when you get a lot of power up and you're running downwind in heavy conditions, uh, you go to jibe, boats often fall over. Um, Ollie and Tim, can you talk me through your heavy weather jibe um, technique? Um, it's, what I mentioned earlier about playing to people's strengths comes into play on our boat. And I think we sail downwind differently to most in that um, Ben, being such a good driver, has such a good feel for the boat that he actually takes the main sheet, main sheet downwind, A, because I'm useless at it, and B, he, he likes to sail downwind with the main sheet so he can pump and so and he's quite strong. Um, so that allows me to do something else. But downwind in the heavy air, I think Richie, so I, we, we changed it around a bit. We spent quite a few years or quite a few regattas changing the way we sailed downwind. Um, and that's another good thing about the SB20 class. I mean, this, this forum is great because anyone can come on and talk and, and read this. But even in those early days, we talked to people like Chris Dare in our first event, um, Michael Cooper with David Chapman. And we were all relatively new to the class in those days. So we're all learning at the same time and we're all trying different things. But we'd learn from each other and we'd copy each other and and, and stuff like that. So um, Richie's obviously, but in the heavy weather stuff, Richie's obviously on the kite. Um, and we just, I, I'm sitting, we swap downwind. So Ben's at the back, Richard's, Richard's on the kite, but he's second to back. And then I jump forward and that allows me being lighter than the fat oaf that Richie is to... Um, Go and settle, sort out the sort out the spinnaker halyard, do all, top, do all the tidying up and so on. So I'm always furthest forward, and then I just, if we, in heavy air, if we just go into a jibe, I take the old sheet. Um, we go into the jibe, and Richie's in. All Richie has to worry about is the new sheet. Um, and and look, a driver, the driver's the king in the jibe. If the driver gets it right, it makes it very easy. Um, the one thing that we used to do very well is if we did have a mishap in a jibe or even just sailing, we would, there would be no hesitation about smoking the spinning halyard. That, as soon as we tip the mast in, or even got, you know, if, if, as soon as the, if we're broached, that's it, the spinning halyard's smoked, um, and, then it's, and then the boat's upright, and then you're pulling like hell to get the spinning back up. I, I remember we, we did that in Cascais, Richie, when we, we jived, we just happened to jive on a lobster pot. I don't know why, it's probably the only lobster pot in the whole of Cascais, but we jived on a lobster pot. Lobster pot just before the finish line and, and it just caught around the rudder and, and tripped us over and the kite was down and back up again and we probably lost 15 metres or so. Um, that's the biggest tip I had with the with the heavy weather jibes is is if you do cock it up, ideally you don't cock it up and you've got a good driver, but if you do, don't worry about trying to get the boat upright without dropping the, without dropping the kite because you're wasting your time. Yes, Ollie, how about you? How do you tackle it? Was that me, sorry? Yeah. 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 Um, so um, we often sail four up. We sort of jump from three to four, depending on um, what our weight is at the time. Um, mainly due to um, Dad and I. Toby's Toby is quite light. What are you doing? Um, Toby is quite light um, in general. So. Um, we're close families in Tasmania, just want you to know for the record. Uh, it's the Tassie thing. Yeah, um, so Toby's quite light. Toby um, is only a year younger than me, um, although he's stayed quite light. So 
um, being on the main, as as Tim said, What's this? we um, <laughs> as Tim said, um, we keep um, we move, uh, we swap Toby and I um, when we go off the breeze to put the lighter person forward. Um, however, we found that. Um, Dad downwind in the light stuff was really good to take the main. But once we got planing um, and through the jibes and stuff, it just got um, too hard for him to do the main as well. So that was really handy having the fourth person because we could send our 40 kilo, 45 kilo kid forward um, to tidy up, to do all that. And it also meant in the windy stuff through the jibes, I had more room on the kite um, with Toby being further back in the boat. Um, but yeah, really in that light stuff, we wanted the weight forward and um, Toby forward. Um, we also found that when we did wipe out through jibes, um, only having one person in front of me meant that I could get to the halyard quicker. Um, and Toby being a bit lighter would be fine to do it in the light stuff, um, but it just got a little bit too much for him um, in the heavy stuff. Um, he probably is strong enough, but it was just that um, the risk of if he's not. Um, and again, that's where Tim said, you've just got to smoke the halide as quickly as you can. Um, once it's back under control, rip it back as quickly as you can and get going again. Um, because, yeah, you can really lose one boat or you can lose half the fleet pretty quickly in these boats. Um, so, yeah, we, um, we've just got our process down pat. We sort of... We keep the jibes pretty simple. Um, however, we um, we change from our positions in the boat is really all that changes. Um, other than that, the jibes stay the same. The speed that the steerer puts it through might change a little bit, um, but that just comes with practice. And to be honest, that's going out there and tipping over a couple of times and actually testing how quick and how like far you can put the boat. And so when you are flat on your side, and I think you might have talked a little bit about this, Tim, I mean, I think I've seen, I think Twirl has just joined us, but um, uh, when um, Brett Cooper has got his spinnaker, you know, caught under the boat, out comes the fishing knife, and I think he's let his spinnaker go with a fishing knife. Um, how do you get the boat up quickly when you've broached? Well, in all honesty, if you can, if you can smoke the, if you can smoke the kite, and you do that well, then you, you don't have to, the boat will come up. Um, but Andrew Smith will attest to this. Um, if it goes wrong, it goes very wrong. Um, keels, rudders, sailing through kites. Um, the, the biggest risk with, the, the biggest with, risk with, with broaching before you get, before you smoke a shoot is getting the kite sheet around the boom, which is problematical because you've got to get it off again. Um, if you, I mean, the, yeah, once the kite's in the water, you it's getting pretty hard. If it's if it's going around the keel or the rudder, then your day's over, really. Um, and that happens more often if the as long as the tack is hard out to the if the tack's hard out to the um, the spinnaker pole, the poles out. And as long and, and when when I say smoke the halyard, you obviously you don't hold on to it because it's going through pretty fast. But you also don't get the head. You don't worry about dropping the head all the way down to the water either. Of course, if, but if the tack's out to the pole and you and as long as you you're controlling the head. It should be okay. Um, if it goes, if it does um, get full of water again, as long as the tack is out to the pole, you just need to obviously have the sheets as loose as possible and then try and grunt the, the halyard up as, as quickly as you can. The biggest, the biggest cock ups with spinnaker I see in the SB twenties is is the set. If you don't get, if you don't time it perfectly. It's the it's the tack not being all the way out to the end of the pole, and then it getting, then you're trawling, and and that's when things go bad. Isn't that right, Smithy? Smithy staying silent. Yeah, I bet he is. <laughs> um, so we've got a few people on. Oh, correct. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Smithy? No, just correct will do. <laughs> Um, we've got a few people online from from around, um, well, from from Hobart and around the world. I'm just wondering, and I've I've already asked Steve this um, at home tonight, but 
is there one thing that you, I, I describe it as a sort of stuff up moment. So when you're out on a race course of, of the one thing you know that brings you down when you're out there, the one thing that you sort of hope you get through every time. And I'm, I'm wondering from other people online tonight what that might be for them and if they wanted to sort of throw out to Tim and Ollie and others online what, what some of their challenges are on the race course that they'd like some assistance with other than falling out of the boat, Smithy. <laughs> falling out of the boat. Okay, first of all, how would we deal with that? <laughs> Hang on to the tiller for a start. Yeah, don't get into the rescue boat, Andrew. <laughs> um, so any, any thoughts from people online? Any, any challenges that you have that you'd like to, um, to ask Tim and Ollie while they're online tonight? No. I um I tell you one thing we we learned very early was the the spinnaker drop coming into the mark. Do you remember in, in um Garda, Tim? Kept trying to bring it down the left hand side and dropping it in the water. And that whole um windward drop or Kiwi drop was absolutely transformational for us, particularly in breeze. That and having that and not not allowing the forward hand, i.e. you, Richard, to try and do it all yourself. Um, and actually, believe it or not, I learned that from David Chapman, who's the world's laziest man. But I watched, <laughs> but I watched him. I watched him. I watched him actually help one of probably the best crewmen in the world, Jerry Mitchell, um, drop the spinnaker one day. And I thought, Jesus Christ, if David Chapman's actually putting in here, this must work. Um, so a two-person drop is is undoubtedly. Um, the best result in those drops. I and mean, obviously, if you've got four people on board, it's a damn sight easier. But, um, you know, the two-person drop. The, I reckon the biggest, the biggest um, you know, moments of stuff up that, that I find in the SB20 is that decision as to whether you plane or not plane downwind. That is, the, you know, that is what wins and loses you the most places. Um, on a race course in, in, in those conditions where it's not quite planning, you're certainly not um, all at the back of the boat. It's just whether or not you put the bow up by 20 degrees and, and get some apparent going or whether you go dead downwind and VMG. And that's, I think, Richie, we used to have a rule and it was a very simple rule and I don't think it was always right, but I think we used to have a rule that unless we could do nine knots planing, we wouldn't, we wouldn't try, we'd, we'd be BMG. Um, I don't even know whether that was the right number. And I mean, I'd be interested, Twirler probably knows, and a few other, Chris Dare and, and Nick probably know. I, that was always, I hated those races where it wasn't quite planing or it wasn't quite VMG because they were, the, they were the, the races we lost the most places in. Either by either plane, trying to plane too early or leaving it too late to plane. Chris, um, you're online tonight. What, what's your take on, on that um, comment about planing? Oh, it, it um, <laughs> well, it, it's not a decision I typically make. I'll leave it to the tactician or the strategist. Um, I think it varies on the fleet. So um, I can't remember doing VMG sailing in Cascai. <laughs> Everyone had just kind of heat her up and send it. Um, and uh, probably in places like Garda as well, um, they've probably got more breeze. But it, it is a critical a critical point um, and I think it depends on the fleet you're in too so and different um, different parts of the, the race course you're on certainly Ben uh, Benny Lamb who's uh, with us obviously this summer had different views on it than what Ollie did around points to, to to sail and so forth and a lot of it was around positioning with other boats so um, but yeah I think if you can't you know It'll depend on your weight, all that type of stuff. Um, so it's probably not a really easy thing to to, to tell. If you, if you had a VMG thing on your boat, you'd better figure it out reasonably. Yeah, yeah and that's true. Um, so you are, you're, you're probably dead right, Chris, and that is probably why it's so hard because it is different in every race and it's different in every position you're in. You're not necessarily going to do it if you're leading the fleet, but if you're late, you'll no. take the risk and so on. It's a bit like the drive set. Look, if you're, if you're, in, the, you know, if you're in the front pack you know you're probably you're racing the five boats around you you know we, we couldn't really care what the people beyond that are doing you know i've seen chapo plenty of times come from 10s go to a complete different corner but and probably heat it up but you can't do anything about it when you you know it always 
it certainly always looks worse if you're VMGing and someone's got the bow up. And then, and it may not be working for them, but it definitely looks like it is working from, yeah. from when you're doing six knots downwind and someone's charging off over the horizon. Yeah. I mean, Fraser's on the line here now. I remember at the, I think it was the regatta we did down there early this year, like he was sailing quite hot. We decided to go slightly deeper angles and he looked really quick, but he ended up behind us. You know, huge, so, yeah. huge distance, but... It's, yeah. Uh, um, one thing that we always, and um, Chapo sort of does it really well, is sort of just really backs his decision in. He might he might go, yeah, righto, we're going to play and we're going to play into the corner. Um, and I think when we were a bit younger, Toby calls the shots down wind and he does it. He actually does a really good job on our boat. Um, or we think so, but um, it was about having the guts to actually back in a decision sometimes. Like a yeah, couple of times we'd yeah. start planning and then we'd go, oh, she was, look at those people inside. Um, and then we'd get stuck in between two and we'd get burnt both ways. Um, so yeah. Davey, Davey just mentions it there that, that you know, Sinbin, you wait for something. You, you don't, you're not normally the first to go and do it unless you're deep. Yeah. If someone, I think um, it's a really interesting comment, Oli, because I've you know been lucky enough. Dave Chapo's done a bit of sailing with me on the fifty two, and you know Benny Lamb and Oli, um, and that. And I think the the, the the ability to back your decision and stick with it, probably nine times out of ten, it'll work. Um, indecision, generally, probably nine times out of ten, is the wrong decision. <laughs> Um, just uh, speaking of backing yourself in and having sort of confidence, and uh, I think of Porco Rosso in this in this instance. But um, when you're coming into the top mark on port and you you don't see a hole for your boat, and you know the photographer is there sitting at the mark waiting to see what's going to happen. Is this going to be a big collision or not? Um, how do you find yourself a hole or create your space and and get through that mark rounding cleanly? Well, I do. Shut your eyes and hold on. Ideally, you don't get yourself there. is is the perfect is the perfect rule, but that's not always that easy. Um, you've got to be looking a long way ahead. You've got to. You know, generally, we are. If we find ourselves on the port A line and we're not, you know, and, and you're in the pack, you, you are looking two or three hundred meters before you get there. You, you're picking a boat that you know you are definitely in front of, and you're saying, right, that's our target, and that's what that's the spot we're going into. And you might take a dozen transoms if you have to, but it is definitely, I mean, it's tough. Garda, Chris, you'll remember Garda. Garda's a nightmare because everyone was coming in on the, Left on the port right. rail. Yeah, and it was literally, you would run it, you would deliberately run into someone. Oh. And, and Garda was different because there was a very long, like, we had two big courses at Garda, so there was a very long reaching leg, a two sail reaching leg, 200 metres long, maybe even longer, probably longer where you couldn't put a spinnaker up, so no one, you weren't going very fast. People would deliberately come in on port, hit you, would not would not even move their tiller. You we can name them, Michael Cooper and David Chapman. Mike, yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you some names. Um, and they would literally put their hand, they, some people would put their hand up before they'd even hit you, put their hand up and say, yeah, sorry. And in, I think in those days, it was one turn only. Was. Well, is... Yeah, so one turn. And they if they ducked 20 boats, they would have been 20 boats behind. They do one turn on a leg where we're only doing five knots anyway, and they've gained 20 positions. Um, I actually think Vinesy might have taken the Russian bloke to the room over that. But So that's, I mean, that it's difficult. It, everyone's got to be, you know, it's only a, it's only a sport and everyone's got to be trying to be fair about it. But ultimately we would always try and nice and early say, right, that's the, you know, we're not winning. We're not going to get third. We're going to have to take some transits here. And then you pick that spot very early on. It, it, it still might get closed by someone and then you are in trouble. But the last thing you want to be doing is not laying the mark and jiving around and taking transits anyway. Well, Richard's a gentleman, you see, because he knows if he did that, we'd take him to the bar and order a lot of very expensive uh, wine. Smithy, <laughs> Smithy's the opposite. He just lets it's everyone anyway. in. Smithy lets everyone in there. It's a shocker. No, as a as a general rule, though, Tim's right. You've got to be planning before then, um, just because like it's something that we instill in kids from a very young age, from whatever class they're in. That it's so dangerous because you might think you're clear, but um, it's it's probably one of the most protest protested rules because 
you've really got to prove that you you're a hundred percent in the right um, doing the right thing. Um, and because it is a high, like it's a corner of the course, so everyone's there at one time, especially in the SB twenties, the one design. You might be getting there um, with 10 to 15 boats around you. Um, so, yeah, you do really need to plan it early, even if that means coming in earlier, taking a little bit of a loss going to the wrong side for 10 to 15 boat lengths before the mark, um, just so that you can get your lane clean coming in. And what about the start line? I mean, I know it's sort of getting a, getting a clean start is obviously the most critical thing to the to the race. I mean, if you've got a crap start, it's hard to you know to, to make up the places you need to to win the race. But um, do you have any uh, secret squirrel tips about the start line, Tim? No, you just give it to Ben Vines. You just say to Ben, you just say to Ben where you what end of the line you want to start at and which way you want to go, and you just leave it. I just I learned after about the third year just to shut up and just let him do it. Um, no, putting the Velocitech on the right way around to start. <laughs> so, no upside down, Mr. Jones. <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, I used to, when I was a nipper, I used to love winning the pin, but it's a pretty low percentage game, that one. Only one boat wins the pin. And more often than not, if, you, you know, if you're trying to win the pin and you don't win it, your race is pretty, you've stuffed your race pretty early on. So we... Um, we, unless you can back yourself really good, and I would always back, say, Ben to, to do that, but we would try, we learnt over the years to just be a little bit less aggressive um, on trying to win either end. I, I remember um, a really good lesson, which probably is sailing 101 to one most people, but it wasn't to me. We got black flagged in Cascais. So we got black flagged in two races. We got one of them back, but there was one race we got black flagged in from a and we finished fourth. They didn't kick you out of the race in those days. Um, and we started in the middle of the line, which you which you automatically think you never you're never over in the middle of the line because of the sag. And I was talking to a very good sailor about it later on. And the first thing he said to me, I, I said, "Oh, we got black flags in a race." And I said, "I can't believe it. We were in the middle of the line when we got black flags." The first thing he said to me was, "What were you doing in the middle of the line?" I went, "Well, we didn't really want it either end." And he said, yes, Tim, but it was a black flag race and you started in the middle of the line. He said, black flag, start at either end. You can't be over when you know there's a pin there or a boat. You know, if you're over and, you can, and you're next to the boat or next to the pin, then you are, you're stupid. In the, in, the, in the middle of the line, it's so much harder to pick where that line is. And I'll, I'll, you know, that was just a throwaway comment. Now, maybe everyone on this forum knows that and they learned that in cadets, but I didn't. Mm. Ollie, what about you? Is um, do, is that your theory about um, <laughs> flying under a black flag? So I think, oh, well, um, maybe not on a black flag. I didn't really think about that. I, I think I'd be a bit more conservative than what Tim and his brother is, for that matter, on black flags. We've we seem to be on the wrong end of a few black flags, um, but Tim was Tim was. I have the same opinion as Tim in that. Start lines are for skippers, um, for steerers. I think start lines are very reactive with boats going up and down all the time. And it's too late if you're already saying to the skipper who then needs to react to a comment. I think um, it's really got to be something that skippers need to practice. And big, big, it changes a lot from club racing to big fleets. We're pretty lucky here in Hobart that we regularly get 20 boats on a start line. Um, but I often found through other classes that when you start in smaller fleets and then you jump into a big fleet, that it's very different. You might be the best starter in a 10 boat fleet, but then you get an 80 boat fleet and you just can't handle that. So it's that big uh, fleet management. Um, but yeah, through, I, I've never really sailed a boat where on the start line, there's been a lot of talk. Um, as a crew member, you're pretty well just calling what's on the, the time and the distance to the line. Um, you might just be pointing out a boat here or there, but um, but yeah, I like, I mean, I did a Dragon Nationals with Nick Rogers and Lee Behrens and that was Nick's rule, was that just, it just has to be him and his, his brain ticking through um, to put, his boat where he wanted it and then after that um we then start getting the more tactical talk going um 
So yeah, that's sort of that's sort of something that I've always um, been. And when I've steered the boat, um, I've sort of only ever really had one person talking before the start, um, and then see where it goes from there. If you get a good start, then you're really away, and then it's about picking the first shift and getting to the side you want. I mean, Jane, um, if I can just offer one tip, because we did the Hamo Worlds. And I couldn't start to save myself. I had Adrian Fingless doing a bit of work with us at the time. And Adrian gave me one piece of advice that I think has helped me a lot in starting. And it doesn't matter where you are on the start line. You obviously want to be at the right end. But it's just about the boat below you and the boat above you. It's all it's about. <laughs> right? So you can't do anything about the boat because he's 10 boats up. And all Funny, that. I remember you know, um, Ben Ainsley talks about that with Robert Scheidt, doesn't he, when Robert Scheidt in one of the Olympic medal races, he was he knew he was over the line. So he sheeted on and everyone around him thought, well, if Robert Scheidt's sheeting on, it's time to go. And it, everyone was over the line. And yeah. that's, how he won the, that's how he won the gold medal. Yeah. It was good advice from Adrian that, you know, I think kind of helped me become a better starter. So. So, what, so what do you do, Chris, on your boat with Ben and so on? Do they, they just, they, it's pretty quiet in the start, is it? They tell you yeah, where they is. want to be? Yeah, it is. They all have their different quirks in how they wish to run the boat. But yeah, Ben Ben Lamb's a bit more directional um, than what other people I've sailed on. Um, David can be as well. Um, but yeah, they kind of give you a, an idea of where they want to be strategically and all that. But look, the last 20 seconds, it's all about you and your positioning. All I'm worried about is the boat below and the boat above. So <laughs> how, do you reckon, how do you reckon it works on the export route? It wouldn't be too quiet on that. No, it's not. And, and, and as we all know, Michael, you know, it, it isn't too quiet. We know that for a fact. Well, it sounds like Michael needs to talk to Adrian Finless. <laughs> he does. He does. So, um, but, yeah, you know, if you're in the last thirty seconds, if you're at the wrong end of the line, you ain't going to change that. I mean, it, it, it is, and I'm a, I, I need to practice what I preach because, when I've sailed with Andrew Smith, I did I did talk too much in the first few races, and and Smith is a very good starter, but whenever I started talking too much, we we'd inevitably cock it up, and I and I realised that, and then he he would disagree with me, but I'd say I, I was a much quieter, and then left it to him. Um, you know, it's only the last twenty or thirty seconds that you have to that you that you leave it to them, but the bloke with the stick or the lady with the stick is in charge. To get your get your boat across the start line. And James, I think the first session we had, we all talked about team dynamics and roles and things like that. You know, so if you've got a good team dynamic and role, there's generally not a lot of chat, and the chat that goes on is only the chat that needs to happen from the person. They don't get involved in the other department, so to speak. <laughs> so. I think it's one of those things, particularly watching Ollie and um, when Ollie's steering, but you know, just how. Um, how relaxed they are on the boat and how they actually look like they're enjoying what they're doing. And I think there's something to be said for that, which I think is what you were saying about the world's down here, Tim, here, Tim is if you're out there to have a good time, often things just fall into place um, and you can sort of outsight your own team sometimes. So, um, and Twirler, I'm not sure if you've got volume or you can hear us now, but um, did you have any um, thoughts on what Tim was saying about the start line? He's swiping left. Twirler, you're not on Tinder. He looks like a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, Twirler? I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can unmute him. Let me see. I'm sure he's swiping left. <laughs> you're right now, Twirler, I think. Oh no, I can't hear no. you. No, you have to put anything in chat you've got to say, I think. You might have no, you're not and you're yeah, not quite sure what's happening there, Twirler. Pop it in chat if you can, because I can't hear you. Tony, I've um, just on that note about team dynamics and, and relaxation. So my brother, who everyone thinks is a famous sailor and a very good sailor, he has taught me nothing about sailing ever. It's one of those brotherly things where he doesn't want to tell me any of his secrets. But the other day I heard, I, I learned something third hand where um, a young kid who he'd obviously been coaching a few years, he said to me, your brother taught me that, Tim. And I said, what's that? And he said, yelling doesn't make you go faster. Yelling gets you nowhere. And I'm, if I'd learnt that maybe 30 years ago, I wouldn't have screamed at Richie so much over the last five years. But <laughs> um, 
Um, Scott and Andy on online, um, do you have any um, tips up your sleeve you'd like to share or um, any questions at all for for the panel tonight? I think Andy Roberts stars with Steve Catchpole on Rebellion and um, is generally pretty, um, puts a lot of thought into sort of the preparation and teamwork. Have you got any questions or tips for the, for the rest of the team tonight? Yeah, I just want to know that back to the spinnaker, we, could, we can get back into the crew work that's seen <laughs> talk about the crews. Um, the, another key one, you talk about a moment to avoid a, um, a spill. One I find is when the kite's going up before the boat's upright on a launch, mm -hmm. that's critical. Um, yeah. if, you, if the boat's healing to any degree, the foot gets caught, picks up a whole load of water on the way out to the, to the end of the pole, and then you, the rest is history. So that's a really um, important one to have the helmsman have the discipline to get the boat upright as, as the launch goes on. And Scott, yeah. did you have any questions at all for the, or tips for the panel? I don't know that I've got any tips for anyone who's uh, listening to this other than we came from a long, long, long way back. And uh, the only thing I've learned is listen to what people have got to say. Nearly everyone's got something that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we didn't sail for 25 years, so uh, we've learned a, a lot from just listening and picking up all these little tips along the way. Don't know how good we'd be about putting them into practice, but uh, there's uh, one thing about the class is everyone is very open with with willing to help and and i think the hobart fleet has compressed significantly we're still at the back but we're actually closer to the front which i guess is some something to uh, look forward to thanks scott and nick um nick rogers you're on online tonight and um we've obviously had a few conversations with nick over the last few sessions but did you if you had one tip to give everyone online tonight, could you um, share perhaps one of the most important things uh, that you think uh, leads to efficient sailing of an SB20? Oh, I just need to unmute you there, Nick. I got it, I got it. Got it, you got it. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the, uh, the biggest things is uh, having, um, you know, we're in my crew, the three of us, Knowing, knowing each other's role in the boat and working together as a team and practice that, practice, 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 so that you don't have to uh, ask the question, who's going to do what? You know what to do. As soon as you get into a uh, situation, whether it be heavy weather, medium weather or a pile of boats, whatever you do, you know exactly what you're going to do. And I think um, knowing where your feet land in the boat, knowing which uh, hand you're going to use to grab a spinnaker sheet or a jib sheet, um, knowing which way you're going to turn when you tack and do everything the same. And uh, you'll find that um, it will feel as if it's just one person in the boat when you have a team working together. And I think that's very important. Thanks, Nick. Um, Jan, you're in, um, you sailed in the Nationals last weekend. Um, you had some pretty heavy weather there at one stage. Do you have any questions at all um, for the panel? Anything that was challenging for your teams when you were sailing? No, there were three days of racing and we had in between 20 and 30 knots. And at one stage uh, going into the port, they even plucked uh, 42 knots which killed my sails a bit. But I can tell you we've done more brooches than we've done starts. And uh, dropping that halyard uh, two, three meters and uh, getting the boat back into the right direction and hoist the kite again was a big, big help. So that helped me a lot. And then I learned something from Jeff Garrett, maybe most of you know him, uh, is like your backstay um, when we had the rig in, in war zone, we call it war zone, it's totally tied on. Um, the starboard side of the, the backstay, you, you tie it, you, you pull it as much as you can and you make a knot there. So you have, the, you have even more to play with with your backstay. So normally your backstay is just uh, with a small loop on the starboard side. And uh, on, on the port side, you have the blocks, which goes up and down, and then you can pull. But at a certain moment, we, yeah, we were block to block. And he said, on the starboard side, pull it as much as you can, and then you have more to play with. That helped us uh, flatten the mainsail upwind uh, a lot. 
Excellent. Thanks, Jan. And Duarte in Portugal, do you have any um, any tips for the for the sailors that are online tonight? Lost Duarte there. I enjoyed very much listening. Uh, I have no no special tips, and uh, it was very nice to 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 be here to to hear you. Thank you. Good to see you. And um, Twirler, let's just try your microphone again. Can you just, um, I'll, I'll unmute you and see, can we hear you yet? Can you hear me? Yes, oh. we can. Hallelujah. You're off tender. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Oh, hey, easy, Bernie. Hey, listen, <laughs> I'll, I'll just jump in. I just made a few notes there that, and, and a few things might help people out, but um, I'll try and be really brief. But uh, 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 about half an hour ago, I saw you. <clears throat> you were talking about um, downwind, whether to put the bow up or bow down, and and I think especially for, um, for for well for everyone all over the world, but especially for Tasmanian sailors, uh, one thing for sure is with an asymmetric boat where you're sailing quite high angles in general, um, and we sort of go with like a, a high plane mode, a lazy plane mode, and then a displacement mode. And the, and, and the angle can change probably up to 30 degrees. And so, for instance, in a westerly, where you get short puffs that are quite narrow, you know, you might want to go a lazy plane mode um, or, a, or a deep mode just to stay in the puff for a lot longer period of time. And, and, and a lot of people make the mistake of getting a really big puff and then sailing quite high to get going fast, but that the, the, the wind isn't there for a very long time. And so you can imagine doing maybe 15 knots um, for, you know, maybe 30 seconds. But if you did uh, 12 knots doing a lazy plane a little bit deeper, um, you know, you would stay in the puff a lot longer and you could do it for up to a minute. And it makes a massive uh, uh, difference to how you're sailing. And I think that's one thing that we always work on, you know, like I'm always looking eyes out of the back of the boat and trying to see how long the gust lasts and how wide the gust is. And then that'll determine as to whether we go up, bow up and plane or whether we go, you know, a deep soaking mode or whatever to stay in the pressure a lot longer. And, and, and like, for instance, if you turn the, 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 the scenario the other way around in a, in a sea breeze in, in Tasmania, um, you know, when a puff comes, you can probably sail a higher mode for a lot longer period of time than what you can in a westerly, for example, would be my um, comment on that. Um, the top mark approach, it's always, it's always a difficult issue, but... Um, if you were to sail in a, in a professional fleet, and I know that I do all the time, when I'm approaching the mark on starboard tack, I'm actually always looking for the port tack boats and the guy that's going to get in there on port tack and maybe foul your race up and tack underneath you and do all that sort of stuff. I, I think for a starboard tacker coming into a top mark, if you want to take it from the other approach, you should look to make sure that you can get around the top mark in a clean position. So I'm not saying that the port tack guy has the right of way, but I am saying that if you think you can get around the top mark and a port tack guy is coming across and you can see he's not going to dip you, then maybe the starter tack guy, it being yourself, should look at maybe dipping him, letting him go, calling him across, waving him to cross you so that you don't foul each other and then getting around the top mark in a, in a safe way. And the reason why I say that is because there's so many times when a port tack boat comes in there and they uh, try and sneak in in a position that's, that's going to foul you, why take yourself out of the race when you could take, uh, you know, when, when you could just still keep him behind you, but still get a good position in the race and a good result? If yeah, that well, makes sense. If, yeah, that makes uh, you're dead right in the in the professional fleets that I've sailed in in the in the far forties, and you are relying on the port tack guy doing the right thing. But the most common call you hear at the top mark is the starboard boat saying cross, but don't tack. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. we'll let we'll let you cross. We'll even duck you. We're on starboard. We'll duck you, but don't but sail on another two boat lengths or a boat length and then tack. 
Exactly. And you both get round the mark. Yeah, that's a really yeah. valid point. And that's what they should do. And then I think in the better fleets, you know, that's that's what happens. You know, yeah. they're kind of more courteous but professional fleets. Yeah. yeah they still they still shouldn't be there, but there is no point in ruining your day for the sake of just stopping yeah. one bloke from getting in the way. Right. Yeah, well, I think that's I think that through regattas, um, I found it in cadets at World Championship quite a lot that you sort of if you go being the nicer person, it helps you later on. Um, and I think that's that sometimes it's better off to duck someone a little bit um, rather than have them tack right on your leg and then you make a bit of an ass of yourself and um, and then you're hated for the rest of the regatta. So again, it's that management of the fleet. Um, mm. The other thing, the last thing was I was going to say was um, you were talking about black flag starts. So at uh, at um, actually the last national championships up at Triabunna, we had there was a black flag start, and I didn't know until uh, post regatta. Um, that actually the PRO decided that he didn't want a pin boat to call a black flag. And the pin boat called two boats over at the pin end that the, that, that, that the PRO on the start boat couldn't see. So two boats shouldn't have sailed the next race that actually did. And it made a massive difference to the, to the, did to it the lose, result. Did it lose you the national toilet? No. But what? No, I won't say anything. But I'm just saying that that what so so when you talk about black flag starts, is that it's that that's actually worthwhile. That's a massive that's a massive massive difference as to how it could equate to that. It's worthwhile talking to the PRO and bringing these things up in the briefing before the before the um, the regatta starts. As in, will you have a boat on the pin calling? People Correct. Boats? Correct. Because because if there are boats over at the pin yeah. end and they and they don't have a pin boat, yeah. then you're covered and you're covered by someone above. Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, most that. most PROs will have a pin boat and they'll call and they'll call pin boats over no matter what it is. But if that's the case, it's just it's just a something that's worthwhile asking for any starts. Um, so my tip there would be that you know use the question in the briefing with the PRO when uh, before the regatta starts and you know try and figure all that sort of stuff out and then you can use that in your equation as to how you calculate the way you might start any start or or, or a black flag start or whatever it might be through the through the event you know if, it, if, it, if there's no calls from the pin. No that pin boat gets in the photographer's way sometimes I get a bit grumpy about the main <laughs> it's just me being selfish. <laughs> Um, look, thanks so much, everyone, for, for tonight. It's um, ten past eight, so I um, I will probably wind up about now. Are there any final comments um, that anyone would like to make before we log off for another fortnight? Anything at all? Okay. All righty. Well, look, thanks so much, Ollie and Tim, for joining us tonight as our as our guests on SB20 Australia in conversation number eight. Um, we've got two sessions left. Um, we're talking women and youth sailing in a fortnight. And then our last session will be with the executive, Australian executive. So um, Scott Glanville, our president, Ollie Burnell is our youth president. So you'll be back on in a, in a month's time, Ollie. Um, Jill Abel as well, and Chris Dare, our VP. So um, just mapping out our direction for the next season. So that'll be in a month's time, but in, in two weeks' time, women and youth discussion. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Don't forget, if you've got um, uh, any questions at all, always send them through. Please encourage your mates to, to get online next, yeah, next fortnight. And uh, it's only, I think, about six weeks to the start of our Australian season, so we're very excited about that. We've got everything crossed for a, for a nice, clean start to the season. Um, to our international guests, thank you very much for joining us tonight and good luck to Arte this weekend um, yeah. in Portugal. We're jealous of you sailing in the sun. That's cool. Hey, Jane, 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 I'd like to leave with one note just to finish off on. Okay, you, you can have the last last call, Twyla. Go if you tell like. Your, tell your effing Premier to open up the borders to South Australia, please. No, mate, why do you think he's no, got a... It's all about you, mate. It's all about you. <laughs> 
We have no COVID-19. No, no, that's fine, but we've said don't let Twirler in. Give us a special Twirler passport, you see, when you can just have a go again. We'd love to have you as soon as we can, Twirler, there's no doubt about that. Um, good to see you all. We'll see you all in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, stay safe, stay COVID-free, and um, have a nice weekend. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. See you Bye. Bye. Good to see you all. Uh, so funny. Thank mm -hmm. you.